most of them don't remember it, but I want to remind you of this truth. People didn't understand, why do you know this? Well, you can now express the protein in a cell that doesn't make the overlap position. What do you think? It's in the media now. The enzymes start showing it up. And you don't have a receptor. So, overlap position is also a fertilization of protein to prevent from it being degraded. And so on. I'm not going to go. This is the, uh, the overlap position is very important for the development of Alzheimer's disease, in the case of the area formation. So, it does a lot of roles. And if you want to read about it, I think Henry Clausen is the one who's done the cloning of the 20 enzymes in both here. Another modification that uh, Dr. Ferron is here and, and uh, is very interested in, in, in the institute is called the GLUT. It's a vitamin key independent gamma carboxylic process. What is it? You're basically transforming a glutamic acid into a double carboxy. It's called the GLUT. Right? And that's very important in blood coding. Well, and also in bone formation, right? So again, not only are you going to be able to transform a serine or a threonine in an all glycosylation, a paragene by an glycosylation, but you can now transform specific glutamic acids into glut. What does it do? It adds two negative charge as opposed to one. So you've changed the charge of the first. Very important for bone formation, very important for blood coagulation. If you hurt yourself and you cut yourself, if you do not have vitamin, or you add warfarin to the noxin, basically, you don't bleed. Okay? You have problems. You cannot coagulate yourself. So you need that modification. Another one is called acylation. Cysteines uh, are strange amino acids. Usually they tend to like to make disulfide bridges. But if the cysteine is in the cytosol, like the cytosolic tail of the plant membrane protein, it, it's very reactive, cysteine. It doesn't stay alone. Okay? So usually the cells make sure that you cover it by what is known as a palmitolation, 16 carbon that you add into it. What would that do? You're adding CH2, CH2 16 times to a system. It will make it highly hydrophobic. It will love to stick to membranes. So anytime you see a protein that has a 15 palmitolation, you can bet on it. It's a membrane, very strongly attached membrane protein. It's one way to anchor it very tightly to the membrane. You can play the game of depalmitolation and palmitolation to move it from one compartment to another. So again, this modification gives you diversity because it allows you to move from compartment by just changing or not having this modification. It's a reversible, as I just said. An interesting one was discovered many, many years ago and finally solved in Texas a few years ago. It's called serine octonylation. Basically, it's a serine again. Sulfate group. What would sulfate group do? It would have a negative charge. 
once you've added a negative charge, you can now modify the function of the metal. Or you can add phosphorylation. In fact, 75% of the, of the protein in our brain okay, are phosphorylated on CD material. So much of your listening to me today, okay, of your memory of what you're looking at me, in the large part, is due to your ability to phosphorylate proteins in your brain. We're going to talk about it. Here's the kind of protein that we discovered, and I'll talk about it at the end of the talk. It's a protein that is a major player in regulating your quality. It's now clinical trial, it's, it's clinical trial has been ended, and, and uh, it's on the market right now, the treatment of this protein. But this is a protein that is decorated most. It has sugars and, and glycosylation sites here, and X, S, 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 It has two phosphorylation sites, and it has a sulfation site on its axis. It has all these modifications, you can play the game. So I want to show you this phosphorylation site. Because it took 130 years, in 1880, all of Hammerstein in, in Sweden, okay, was the first to look at milk, the mother of milk, which he created. And he says, that's funny, this milk, you know, has some phosphate. That time the chemist had began to know what phosphate is all about. He said, milk has phosphate. And he isolated the protein from the from the nature of protein, called casein. Maybe he did a lot of casein. And he was able to isolate, this is 1880, what, this is 1883. He was able to isolate the milk and found out that actually phosphate is attached to the protein. So that was the first evidence that it exists. Phosphorylated the protein. No one understood how and why. But yes, caffeine is very phosphorylated. In fact, milk, many proteins in milk are highly phosphorylated because you want them to be very solid. Phosphate means negative charge. And it took a number of years. People didn't understand what it was. Uh, was it one enzyme that does this? How many enzymes? And, you know, kinases, there's about seven, eight hundred kinases in the cytosol of the cell. But this is not a cytosol. Casein is a secretor. It has a peptide, it has a fluid, and so on. It's not in the cytosol. So what is the kinase responsible for the phosphorylation of casein? It was just, and the, the person who's done it, he's giving a talk here on Monday, he's already done, it's called Vincent Tagliarachi from Jack Dixon's lab. He was able in 2012, 130, 130 years later, to finally identify the kinase. And it turns out that there's only one kinase. 700 kinases in the cytosome, but only one kinase in the secretory muscle. So, well, how did he do it? He did a lot of PCRs. And he was able to identify a family of kinases, but only one of them is in the secretory pathway, and it's phosphorylated seed. Another one that he identified phosphorylated sugars. You can phosphorylate sugars, like with amino acid. But to phosphorylate the seed, there's only one. It's called family C, 20 Interestingly, he just discovered that it's activated by a lipid called sphingotin. Depending on your diet, you can have more or less fingers, and you can have more or less. This finger thing activates 130 fold the activity of this kinase. So that means your diet will affect how you phosphorylate certain proteins. People didn't realize you can just modify that. It turns out that phosphorylation is protective, so you're better off to have phosphorylated protein than dephosphorylated. And it's not reversible, it's different from the cytosol, which has phosphatases. There is no phosphatase. So once you add it to phosphate, right. and then we discover another kinase that phosphorylated right. So what do we learn from this protein? It's a single kinase, it's not too big, as you can see about 400 amino acids. It is stuck in the ER, in the, in the lumen of the gold. So first thing, we knew for many years that the phosphorylation of protein occurs in the, in the gold We don't understand why. Why the gold People are beginning to understand because it gets activated in the bush itself. And it's very, very specific, this enzyme. And you better look at your protein. If you're working with protein, check for a single motif. It's a very simple one. Serine X glutamic acid or a phosphorylated serine. Whenever you have a serine X negative charge like glutamic acid, you will get phosphorylated. So this is just emerging. Very new, I'm telling you. 
but last year is beginning to really explode. Now, turns out that it's not so simple, but there is another motif, SQ, XX, EV, or E. That's a term that's more red. The common one is this one. All right. Now, you can now take any cell. In this case, it's HT cell. Isolate the protein, and then modify, see which one of them are phosphorylated. This is a HG2 cell, the liver cell. And you can do mass spectrometry to identify the phosphorylated group. You can see that many proteins are phosphorylated. Many that nobody even thought about. Okay. So think about it. This is a modification that will modify deeply your um, ability to have a certain function. And it can be modified by that, by stimulus. Very important. Alright. So here's the protein. It gets translated, as I told you, in the lumen. Here is the kinase. And they both meet in the gold sheet itself. The kinase is activated. The kinase is activated. Here's the protein. And the kinase is in red. Once the kinase is activated, it will need ATP that will have to go in. It requires ATP and minor and major. And it will phosphorylate the protein. And it can So, remember, this kind of phosphorylation is not in the ER like the asparagine. Glycosylation, as I told you, that occurs in the endoplasmic reticulum. We're now into the bush. We're moving in. Now we're moving in even further. We're going to go now to the last lamellae of the bush. This is where the game starts. This is where you get the biggest diversity. This is where a protein can give you up to 60 different tribes. Imagine, one gene will give you 60 different proteins. That's quite a That is done by an irreversible modification of the phosphorylated condition. Now, if you look at the genome that we have, the enzymes that are in our proteases now, okay, they only represent about 2.8% of the total genome that we have. So 2.8% of our genome is involved in cleaning. Cutting. Of these, 90% degrade. The function is not to actually generate a new function, is to get to the you know, bring it back to amino acids. 10% make the big jump of actually transforming a protein into a different force. Now there are five different kinds of proteins. And they are divided based on the amino acid that is critical for the activity. For example, an aspartic protein that is involved in Alzheimer's disease, for example, that everybody's been using this as a HIV protease that is now being used as an antiretroviral drug, these are aspartic proteins. They require specific aspartic acid for the activity of the enzyme. The drug, they're, they're targeting the aspartic acid. Cysteine proteases are usually digestive proteins, but they also can do other stuff. Metalloproteases are notorious. This is what causes cancer metastasis. Okay? All the cells that have to migrate out and go in different places require metalloproteases open the field for them to start moving outside of the cell, outside of the, of the extracellular base. CD proteases are the most famous one, and these are the ones we're going to concentrate on. And finally, the threonine proteases are what is known as the proteases. As we're going to talk about, proteases is the cytosome. Proteasome is the garbage collector. It's the one that cleans up the proteins of the cytosome. These are threonine proteases. What are these proteins? Well, we have what is known as the C terminal processing modification. So, when a protein is cut, here's the protein that's going to be cut. Okay? You can extract it, doesn't matter for some reason. It's cutting a peptide bond, right? Here's the tyrosine sulfation, here's the, the acylation of the end terminal, uh, and so on. Once it's cut, if there is a ligating residue or a basic residue at the C terminal, you have an enzyme called the carboxy peptide. It out. So that's why when you isolate the hormone that you're thinking that is doing your job, you never find the terminal oxygen residue because they're removed by the carboxyphetamines. If ever there is a glycine just before this ligatic residue, it will be amidated by an enzyme called the amidation enzyme, a combination of two enzymes. Now, amidation enzyme, if you try to knock out this enzyme, you die. You have no, no baby, no fetus without the amidation enzyme. Clearly, many of our hormones require amidation. Vasopressin, for example, for control of your blood pressure. Oxytocin, 
oxytocin for a woman who is getting a baby and needs to deliver the baby requires an animation. Many of the hormones that you have in our body have animated systems. Because the receptors recognize this function. Today we're going to concentrate on actual cleavage. What are the enzymes that cleave a protein and transform it into this? So you can get an intracellular or a surface cleavage, or you can get an epitracellular. Both of are proliated and porous to allow cancer cells to move. If you cut yourself, for example, and you get blood, you need to make clots. Okay? So you have 12 different enzymes in your blood which will make sure that you will clot your blood so that you don't bleed to death. Okay? This is called extra sensitization. And I'm not going to be talking about it. It's another case. We're going to be talking about the intra Once you go into the intra which you can get feeding protein, usually that's feeding protein, or metabolism. Let's talk about the intercellular We now begin to bring the term the property converted. I worked on this three years to be able to identify the studies that we're going to talk about. It was very difficult. Very tough in time to isolate. Very resilient to purification. So we have to use all types of methods now to identify. And then it's like this guy who's trying to, you know, take a thing under his umbrella and some smart and it decided to cut the hole in, in the umbrella, and mm -hmm. as he stayed, so one thing he was in the, in the shape, he has tan just the same size as the cut. Mm -hmm. The point I want to make here is that the conversations that we talk about are very, very specific. They don't cut anywhere, they cut at a specific position to create a new function. That's the game here. We are one protein, create more than one function. That's the one. I want you to learn a nomenclature. In the literature, it's important because you haven't seen any, any of these papers. Imagine that this surface here is an enzyme. And imagine that this peptide here is entering inside the catalytic pocket of the enzyme. Okay? Because that's how the enzyme is going to cut. It's going to have to accept the protein of the peptide in its pocket and cut it. Here's the cleavage site, right there. You see? So we define that the cleavage site and terminus of the cleavage site is called the P1, P2, P3, P4 position here, P1, P2, P3, P4 position. And what's after the cleavage site? The terminus is defined. Now, everybody uses this nomenclature, P1 prime, P2 prime, and P1 prime. So when you tell you that this enzyme is specific for an arginine residue, it is specific for a P1 arginine. So that's the specificity of the cleavage. So what happens when you do this? If you have a protein, it doesn't matter which one. If it's one of the protein, you see, or you can have a membrane-bound protein here, one time or two times, or the same time, whatever you want. It will get, it has the signal peptide, or it has the strong membrane domain, it has the visa to get it. It's going into the ER. Once it goes in, it will add the sugars and so on, it will move to the gorge. Once it reaches the gorge, you know, the decision has to be made. Are we going to allow this protein to get out as such, or are we going to cut it in different pieces? Are we going to be the uh, tailor that's going to make it best out of this blood protein that doesn't have any shape and transform it into actually very active? Right. So, now these motifs here that we're going to talk about is that the convertators will require a recognition motif to cut them. Usually, we thought until about two, three years ago that this cutting will now generate a piece here out of the piece of protein. We usually saw that this was turned on. In other words, we're creating a sequence, we're creating a structure. We're getting a gain of function. But we recently showed that this kind of thing can actually be a loss of function. It can actually transform, as we saw in FGF23. It's cleaved, it's lost its function. Okay? We can get, now more and more we begin to see that. So, cleavage is a way to either generate a new function or lose it. And it's up to the time to make a decision which direction to take. So this is the kind of timetable from the Mendelian basis until we are now. It took many years until the yeast was the first source of the solution to the problem. What are the enzymes that cut the protein in the secondary plasma? The yeast is much simpler organism, it's a single cell. Okay? But it's different, it's similar to us, it has to mate. We have to mate and get 
children and so on, but they used to the same thing too. They need a hormone called alpha mating factor. For them to mate, the haploids will mate and make a difference. And so the question is, what activates this hormone? How do they mate? So you can use it, mutants, to isolate mutants that don't mate. And then ask the question, what happens? What are the genes that are modified? So Jeremy Thorner in 1984 was able to identify the first processing enzyme in it. He calls it Cas2 protease. But really, the human equivalent was not discovered. But many years ago, by John Hartman, who was interested in a tumor, he found he had a lady who came to the clinic with a huge tumor of the pancreas. Okay. She was going to die, and she had to be operated to cut out the tumor. But he got the tumor. So he figured that this tumor must be producing a lot of insulin. And he was able to extract the tumor, which has so much insulin now. He said there must be the enzyme that activates insulin out of it. And he said, I told him, kept a biochemically two enzymes, he called it type 1 and type 2, from this tumor. And he said that for making insulin, you need two enzymes. But he had not cloned them. He just knew that there was two activities. But it was the first thought that to make insulin, it doesn't take one enzyme, it takes two. This is where we came in, and we started isolating the whole pattern of conversations. It's a long story, as you can see, it took 13 years. But from 1990 all the way now, 2002 and 2003, we isolated the nine enzymes in this study. They turned out to be similar to each other, the first seven, and I want you to remember that. And then the other two, we will see this is the one that is in clinic right now. Okay. So, today what I'd like you to get an idea, you know that there are nine enzymes in the secretory pathway that will shape your person. I want you to understand that. Each enzyme has its own function. Okay, they're not the same. When you come out of here, I'd like you to remember that there are nine of them, and depending on which one you want to use, you're going to create different kind of proteins. I want you to learn what do we know about them. So, so here are they. Are. They turn out all of them to be seen protein of the subdivided enzyme. Now this was unexpected. I was seen in the best enzymologist in the world in Austria, and he was telling me, "No way, it's going to be." Healing protein is related to trypsin and kind of trypsin because bacteria are too far away. You cannot see bacteria in there, but it was wrong. It turned out that this is a family of healing protein has a serial reactive site, and they are much more related to bacteria than they are to the blood coagulation types, which are seeing proteins also. So it's a very ancient program. We estimate around 600 million years ago at least they appeared. 600 to 800 million years ago. The dinosaurs have it. Uh, Of these seven first 
So what they do? We discovered that the seven first three proteins only at basic residue. Usually it's an arginine. It must be preceded by another arginine or lysine one at the P2, P4, or P6 stage. So there must be two basic residues for a convertase to function. It cannot function by a single basic residue. For a thrombin, for example, only requires one. Then there are these two strange enzymes that when, when we discover them, we can understand what was going on. They are very similar, as you can see, in terms of structure, except they don't cut at this place. This one cuts at the non basic residue, but it requires a P4 arginine. This one, you will see, is a major player that regulates the synthesis of your fatty acids, cholesterol. If you do not have ski one, you don't have a brain. Right? We've created animals, chicken, and so on, without this. They should not have a brain. Right? It's a major player in defining how your body is going up. This is some example. And finally, you have the last one, which is a real one. It cleaves itself once, because all of these enzymes, as they tell you, autocatalytically cleave themselves in the ER. So there was the removal of this red part, is done by the enzyme itself. It recognizes its own motor within. And the only one is this one that cleaves itself. But never gets rid of its purpose. What does that mean? It means it will never become an enzyme afterwards. Why would God create an enzyme today? You can understand as we will talk. So, I want you to remember this. So, all enzymes, all these convertases are synthesized as precursors. They are inactive because the protomain is inside the catalytic subunit. It allows it to get the right shape. That's it. That's the channel. Okay? But then, it has to get rid of it. It has to be able to. To get rid of it to become an active enzyme. So it gets to visa, you're cut, you can get out. It gets out, it goes to the Golgi or it goes to the granules or whatever, it's still dead, the enzyme cannot function. Until it reaches the right compartment with the right concentration of calcium, pH, and so on, you will now usually kill, cut itself a second time. Once it becomes active, it can hit any other substance. So you can see that. In order to go from an enzyme that is started to an active enzyme, there is some regulatory steps to define where the active enzyme is going to be. So we've done a lot of cell biology here, a lot of electron microscopy and so on, to identify where these enzymes are. But it turns out that they're actually their own this. In simplest one, as we call the first two enzymes, identified called PC1 and PC2, pro-protein convertase 1 and pro-protein convertase 2. They are the ones who make all the hormones of your body. If you have a memory problem, or if you have pain, or if you have insulin sensitivity, glucagon, whatever, all the hormones of your body are made by these two enzymes that cooperate with you. The other five, they go into the last family of the Golgi, and they can go to the cell surface and back. They can do that. Viruses and bacteria love that. But they say, why should I synthesize? An enzyme to activate my surface like a protein. I just have to exploit the ability of the cell to bring me this enzyme at the cell surface, get cut, and I infect. Exactly what the virus is doing. The virus, the Ebola virus, the HIV virus, they all use the same program. They exploit the ability of the cell to cut them at the cell surface to get two, en two enzymes called PACE1 and PC5 can get out of the cell surface, they're solid in this case, but they're recaptured again. Covering some very protein like that. It's a very negative charge. It's extremely important for the body to decide whether you have how many codes, how many uh, ribs. They decide it's, it's directional, it's really polar. It's in these interactions with specific covering some very protein that therefore polarize them along the axis of your body. So, the distribution of these enzymes is better. The one that's simplest one is the CD4. It turns out to be only in the testes and in the ovaries, and it's a major one for reproduction. If you do not have CD4, you are very infertile. Simple. So we try to, because in our society is more for female, that we try to use this to make a major placenta. It's very easy. If you block CD4, your your sperm cannot activate. If you want to penetrate the ovum, but the companies don't want that. But we will find a way to to somehow commercialize it. This is a major player to allow it's a germinal cell and it allows basically the sperm to get into the ovum. Okay? That's the simplest one. For 
complicated one. I told you the PC1 and PC2, they are all endocrine granules, big granules, I told you that, small hormones. Furin is everywhere, we'll come back to it. PC5 is widespread, it's secreted. Phase 4 also. PC7, you will see, it's not secreted, it's ubiquitous, but it's not very common. C1 is also in the gorge, it never gets to the session. And finally, PCS canine is only in the liver, small intestine, and kidney, and that's what we're going to talk about for the clinical application. We're going to come to that one. What do they do? What kind of substrates do they cut? It took a number of years, a number of people around the world, once these were identified, to say, hey, why don't you cut? Where is it cut? What does it do? So you can see that many of the hormones are cut are PC1 and PC2, the glucagon, the alpha MSH, the GLT1, the CTH, beta androgen. Furin is the most wide one to use, it's cutting a lot of protein. Usually, constitutively secreted proteins, the things that reach the cell surface. Prostatins, receptors, adhesion molecules, metalloproteases, even viral vector proteins like HIV, I told you, use it to get it. In fact, it's not in clinic for that. Okay. Antibacterial toxins are the anthrax toxins. You heard about in the White House when they got an anthrax uh, letter, it's full of anthrax, and then you began to give them some of this urine to get to just in case, to block the entry of the anthrax. Uh, PC7, we'll come back to this. Specific protease. C1 will talk about it, and also PCS. These are the clinical drugs. Just for you to know, if you're interested in this, the clinical research institute, we're very much interested in seeing well, what we've learned of these enzymes can you actually find in clinical. These are all over the world, the clinical application of which one of these enzymes. The most advanced ones are PCS, and we'll talk about it at the end, for both hypercholesterolemia, they are too much cholesterol and we're resistant. 